Welcome to the Intentional Encourager podcast, where each episode brings you compelling conversations and stories designed to entertain, enlighten, and encourage. And now here's your host, Brian Sexton. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton. I am intentionally encouraged when I see people doing business the right way. And for the last 15 years, Damon Burton and his team at SEO National have done just that. Now you might say, Brian, what can they do for me and my business? I'm going to tell you what they can do for you. They can help you understand search engine optimization. There are a lot of players out there in the marketplace, but you want a team of people that are going to be dedicated to working with you and helping you to understand search engine optimization and how you can show up higher on search engines so that you can bring more revenue into your business. Damon and his team are full of integrity, honesty, decency, and trust. And if that's important to you and that encourages you, I would encourage you to give them a call today at 855-736-6285 or go to seonational.com and get a free quote and tell them you heard about it on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Get ready for a dynamite conversation coming up right now on the Intentional Encourager podcast. And welcome into the Intentional Encourager podcast. I'm your host, Brian Sexton. Thank you for joining us again today. Part two of my conversation with the host of the Vigilance for the End Times podcast, Mark Judy. And this part of the podcast, as you know now, is is Mark's story. And so Mark and I connected. Powerful story. So I want to save a lot of space and room for Mark and his story. So, Mark, take me back as far back as you want to go and tell your story. And I'll jump in with a question or two that I have that that I want to ask. But, again, so appreciate you joining me today on the Intentional Encourager podcast. Thank you, Brian. It really means a lot. Um, Well, we were just talking before you hit the record button a minute ago. Um, You were asking uh, how a North Carolina boy ended up in Canada, where I live now. And... um, your your intentional encouragement podcast. Um, you know, there's so many times when we forget that real encouragement, encouragement that we really need so many times is when we're all alone, there's no one around us to encourage us, we're going through some heavy-duty stuff, and God's the only one that can come through. And that's how I met my wife back in 2001. Um, Living in Florida at the time, I was going through a really rough time in my life. And um, so I decided to try to go online and find a place where I could post a prayer request and uh, found a website. So I post my long-winded, please pray for me, I'm going through a horrible time. I posted my prayer request, and the Holy Spirit really nudged me uh, to get me out of my self-pity mode. And he said, well, now, you know, people are going to pray for you. You're, you're going to be looked after. Why don't you take the time to pray for somebody else? And uh, I'm scrolling through these pages of the prayer request on this website. It was called Christian, Christian Prayer Chat. It doesn't exist anymore. And... Um, I'm reading through all the prayer requests, and I see this name come up, uh, and it was Rupa, R-O-O-P-A. And I remember thinking to myself, that's a very unusual name. I never saw that name, and I started reading her prayer request. And um, I mean, it completely had a different tone than all the other prayer requests I'd been reading, which were very generic in nature, mostly. Um and her prayer request was simply, please pray for me. Uh, I'm the only Christian in my faith, and I feel so alone in my faith. And my heart just broke for this precious believer, um, because I've been in North America all my life. I've been a Christian since 1978. Never encountered anybody and all my Christian travels who said, oh, I feel so alone as a Christian at home. The point where it pained them. And so I simply just sent this Rupa a quick email 
And all I said was, I just want to let you know you're not alone. Someone's praying for you. That was late Saturday night, March 11th, 2001. The next morning I get up and there's this huge glowing email from this Rupa person just gushing with joy. Uh, she was just so amazed that anyone would take the time to write her. And she just thanked me profusely for her in her, my prayers. And one thing led to another. We became prayer um, pen pals through email. And I just saw something in her that was so different from any of the believers I had known in my life. Uh, she was so full of joy in spite of what she was going through. She was, um, her family was East Indian uh, and their religion was Sikhism, um, which is a very, uh, it's a very powerful and strong um, religious spirit, if you will. Uh, it's just got a real heaviness to it. And she was always dealing with that. And long story short, um, we began chatting by phone not long after that. And as time progressed, I knew, I knew probably within the first week um, that God had some plans for, and the Lord said, just keep your big mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> if it's me, I'll do it. I don't need your help. <laughs> and um, by the summer, late summer of that year, we were married. I flew up from Florida to Canada. Um, she took another huge step of faith ever witnessed before in my life. She got baptized at a church locally for an East Indian believer to get baptized. And their whole family is Sikh. Um, that is basically closing the door on your family. And, and, and insofar as how they look at it. When I attended her baptism service, her family came, but they were sitting in the back and they were all in tears because they were watching their daughter break away from them. And so my wife paid a really huge price for her faith. In North America, I mean, the, I hear people complaining that they have to work next to a coworker who swears all the time or, you know, whatever, but we really don't know in North America, what it's like to have to pay that kind of a price to follow the Lord. And um, she she lived her whole life like that. She was um, she was one of the most wholeheartedly devoted believers I've ever known in my life. I mean, mm -hmm. when she was living at home alone with her family, as the only believer, uh, her refuge was being in her bedroom, playing worship music, just being at the feet of the Lord. Did she tell you how she came to come, how she came to know the Lord originally? Yes, and it goes right to your intentional encourager title again. This, this elderly white lady who was a Christian, God knows how to set these things up, um, Rupa was born... Uh, had polio shortly after she was born. And the East Indian culture, uh, especially uh, if you have a disability, it simply means you did something bad in your past life, so you got your payback now. So there was no pity emotionally in her family for her disability. Um, and so brought this wonderful lady named Judy Brown into her life who took her to doctor's appointments and medical appointments um, because she had to get surgery for the polio and treatments. And over the course of time, this elderly lady built a friendship with Rupa, who was, I think, 15 or 16 at the time. And she began going to church with Judy. Um, she began going to, like, Christian functions and different things. And gradually, God began to open her heart up because she had been so hurt 
by her family. She was just basically in a ball of, of depression and misery. But she began to feel loved by these people that called themselves Christians. She began to feel like there were people who cared about her and who had compassion on her. And when she was, I believe, 17 years old, uh, she gave her heart to the Lord um, at, a, at a church function Judy had gone to. And um, she got baptized not long afterwards. Uh, she had been completely engulfed in depression and suicidal thoughts because basically life was that bad and she just wanted to end it. Um, she got totally delivered from all of that. She was basically like this 400 watt light bulb. She was all lit up after that, just joined, which was the, the group of that I met. And um, her family couldn't stand that their sister was no longer depressed and suicidal. She was radiating this joy that they didn't have. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the transformation was complete and total and miraculous. And, um, and that's always the way. Um, she spent a lot of time volunteering at uh, women's shelters and different places like that. Um, she became just so outwardly focused on other people. It was, it was amazing. It's amazing how you two meet because, you know, obviously, um, this was before Christian mingle or, you know, things like that. Yeah. So she lives in Canada, correct? So you moved yeah. to Canada. I sure did. <laughs> Take me through your married. Did, did the relationship with her, her, your, your in-laws ever improve? Were you able to kind of bridge the gap between your wife and her family? Take me through that dynamic a little bit more. Well, um, when Rupa came to the Lord, she got a lot of abuse and hostility from her family in that regard. And she knew what she was dealing with there spiritually. And then um, when I, when the Lord brought her and I, I was at a place where I had basically thought, okay, you know what, I've, I've got this idea in my mind of, of uh, who I would like to marry and what I'd like them to be like, but um, nothing was happening. So I just said, okay, God, you know what? It's just you and me. I'm okay. That's great. I'm fine. Two months later, God brings us together online. Um, but basically, we were conversing uh, at a point on on the phone for like two and three hours a day. Um, I flew up here for her baptism uh, to support her because I knew what she was going through. And just before I left to fly up here, I had gone into a Christian bookstore and I'm browsing around and I see this little jewelry case and I see these little rings and I see this silver band that has a little verse from Song of Solomon on it. And I knew that the book of the Song of Solomon was her favorite book. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton. Prices are going up by the day. We've got to find ways to increase our household revenue. Now, a couple ways you could do that is, one, you could go and ask your boss for a raise, but if that doesn't work, I've got another way for you. It's my friend Joe Hart's program called Products for Profit. Joe's been a guest here on the Intentional Encourage podcast and told his story about how learning retail arbitrage changed his life, and he's been helping thousands of people change theirs. Now, retail arbitrage is simply this. It's taking a product and buying it and then reselling it online for a higher price, and you keep the profits. And guess what? Amazon and Walmart use third-party resellers every day to fulfill their customer orders. I want you to go to productsforprofit.com or productsforprofit.carrd.co. Get connected to Joe's team. Tell them you heard about it on the Intentional Encourager podcast and start making money today with Products for Profit. And now let's get back to more great conversation on the Intentional Encourager podcast. And when I read the scripture that was inscribed on the band, it said, I am my beloved's and he is mine. 
<laughs> I was like, okay, I'm out. Rap, taking this with me. And so at some point in time, I, I proposed to her uh, after her baptism service, and the rest is history. And But marrying a white guy was the next big no-no for an East Indian girl in the Sikh culture. You marry into your own and you marry your own people. In fact, most of them are arranged marriages. And now here in the Edmonton area of Alberta, Canada, back then, this is going back to 2001, uh, there had been a series of honor killings that had taken place. Um, very horrific things. I was afraid for her because I had to go back to Florida to settle up things before I moved up here for good. And I was very concerned for her well-being and safety. But to make a long story short, when you were asking me if there were ever, if there was ever a way to, um, you know, bridge the gaps and so forth, um, it never really came around to that. Um, there, and actually, a couple of Rupa's sisters had come to the faith years and years before her. But because of the pressure, the religious pressure from the parents, they caved in and they left God. They left Jesus. They went back to the temple because they could not handle the, the um, just being ostracized by their own family. Yep. And with East Indians, that seems to be one of the major, um, major things that they have to deal with. Now, for you both, let me, if you don't mind me asking this, Mark, sure. was this the first marriage for the two of you? Had you been married previously? Had she been married previously? What What was that like? Because I'm, I'm always interested. I'm curious about the dynamic because yeah. um, you guys meet in a very unconventional way. My wife and I, did. <laughs> we, we met, we didn't meet online, but we met, met very unconventionally. Yeah. Um, was it the first marital relationship for you both? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I had been in a relationship years and years before, back in 1989, but it didn't really last. And um, that was the yuppie years. So you were pretty content. I mean, being, being a bachelor, you were, I, I mean, were, were you, were you looking? Were you like, oh. Hey, yeah. Oh my gosh. Every time I went to church, my radar were up like, God, is this, <laughs> is this the one? And I ended up being, you know, really good brotherly friends with some because they didn't see me the way I saw them. But, you know, oh God, be perfect, you know. But it's really, God knows who we're made for he knows how he made us and i think he i know he kept me from a lot of situations i mean i i always based things on how somebody was at church how they acted at church um she's so spiritual she worships with you know she worships god all out you know i like that but you know, that's not the whole inner workings of the person you know um, Rupa was the first one that I had ever known in my life who really came to God in such a fiery furnace kind of a way. And, and that's where she lived. She li actually lived in a fiery furnace with for a long time. So was she the same? Did, did you find her to be the same all the time that you, that you guys, because you, you hit on a really good point. <laughs> It's one thing when you find that person, you're in the dating stage, you're, you're making sure your hair is perfect. You're making sure everything is, is perfect. And then I think that's the biggest reason at times why a lot of marriages don't work because it's different when you're dating somebody and when you're living with somebody as man and wife and, and it's like, well, and then people say, well, we should live together first just to see if we're going to be compatible. It's like, well, that's not godly either. No. You know, so I, I want to fast forward for a minute. You and Rupa get together. You guys are married. How is 
you you understand that she has lived with this crippling disease of polio that yeah. most all of her life. And so take me to the next chapter of your life together. Um, you know, how was that for you guys with the, with the physical, with the physical difficulties that she had to deal with on a daily basis? You know, Brian, for me, um, and I'll go first saw her for the very first time at the airport when I came up. Um, because the Rupa that I fell in love with, I mean, like within the first week of us emailing, um, I just felt in her emails, I felt something that I had never felt before. I saw something in her that I had never felt before. And not even in a, not, not just in a, in a female believer, but in any believer that I'd known, um, a depth of sincerity and just, just genuine, all out for the Lord, genuine love for God. Um, and she was so real. She was just so absolutely, uh, that saying, what you see is what you get. That was Rupa. And I remember saying to the Lord in the first week, I said, God, if, if, if she doesn't fall in love with me, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a clue. I mean, I really felt it. And, but I let God take the lead in the relationship. And I was just basically a supportive, praying, caring brother in the Lord. And whatever happens, happens. And within a few months, she, you know, calls me up at my job and says, Mark, I have to tell you something. Uh, I love you. And then she hung up and I'm like, that was weird. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, she said, I love you. Okay. That's a clue mark. Um, but she always was, she was the same Rupa after we got married as she was in all those months leading up to it. She, she never had to put on anything. And the thing I loved about her was she, she never put on for anyone. If we went to a church, if we went to a function, she didn't have to affect a pose. For she didn't know how to do that. She was so completely void of pretense. And that just made me love her all the more. Um, in the church world, um, most of it is about affecting a pose. I mean, if we're honest, most of it's, you know, you, you go to church on a given day, you're not feeling like going, you feel like poop. You feel like when you go inside, ah, hi, everybody. You know, that's not who you really are. Yeah. You don't walk in acting like you're feeling because we're conditioned to think that way. Well, Mark, I don't walk into church every Sunday excited to be there. And I've told people, I'm like, listen, you guys are way more hyped about being here than I am because, you know, I've, I've been on a, I've been out of town all week and, you know, I didn't sleep good last night. That's what I, that's where I say to people. It's like the word that I hate the most is passion. I can't stand that word because I don't wake up every morning feeling passionate. passionate. <laughs> I just don't Most wake up every morning. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? On, I, I know on Sunday mornings, I have a purpose. Yeah. I got somewhere to be. Yeah. And, and the purpose for me being there is to worship the Lord, to try to make impact on somebody else through ministry and things like that. And so it's, it, it is what it is. I, I want to, to take the next step in this conversation and talk about, you know, you, you guys, you mentioned your daughter, yeah. but I, I want to go to what you, what you dealt with 2018, 2019 and, and really what connected you and I together was you, you just shared with me, Hey Brian, here's what happened in my life being a caregiver. And, and, yeah. This is the thing, Mark, 280 plus episodes. I don't know that we've had an episode like this where I'm talking to somebody that was their wife's, not only was their partner, their spouse, their lover, things like that. You ended up being your wife's caregiver. Yeah. Take me through that part of, of what you went through being her caregiver. And again, folks, it may be, some some of you, this may be a little tough for you. Might be walking in a similar situation, but I want to hear this from your perspective, Mark. Yeah, 
You know, um, everything was was absolutely hunky dory when we first got married. Um, I remember initially treating her like a china doll because I wasn't sure how the disease affected her. Um, I wasn't sure. I didn't want her to like trip and fall and, and really hurt herself. So she had to really get on my case a few times to not treat her like a china doll. Um, I really had trouble keeping up with her. I mean, she was so highly functional in spite of the polio. Um, her, her right leg, we called her her baby polio. We called her her baby leg. Uh, because of the polio, it was, you know, non-functional. It was um, it was like two or three feet off touch the ground. She'd been walking with a crutch since she was nine. Um, but when we we had our daughter Asha in 2004, and within a couple of months, our whole world turned upside down totally. Um, she would call me up at my job tears <clears throat> begging me to come home early because she was in too much pain to lift Asha out of the crib to change her diaper. Hey everybody, Brian Sexton. You know dreams are powerful pieces of intentional encouragement. We all have them. If you're a business owner, you've probably always dreamed of taking your sales to levels you've never seen before. I've got a guy that can help you with that. His name is Brad Norwood. My good buddy Brad has been on the Intentional Encourager podcast as a guest before, and he is a dream specialist. His company, Dream It Pro, offers incentive packages to travel to places such as the Masters, Kentucky Derby, the Super Bowl, even exotic places that you've always wanted to take your team, but you just didn't know how to do it. Brad's your guy. And oh, by the way, Brad's a certified bucket list coach, so he can help your team members achieve their personal dreams as well. I want you to go to www.dreamitpro.com and find out more or call him directly at 479-466-6907. And by the way, tell him you heard it on the Intentional Encourage podcast. Let's get back to more great conversation here on the Intentional Encourage podcast. And that's when I knew something is horribly wrong and we didn't know what. That started years and years of trying to find doctors who understood what we later came to find out was post-polio syndrome. And basically triggered by the childbearing situation, uh, having a baby girl, um, it just put her body through so much stuff and basically it was like the polio symptoms came back again but worse um she had full body electric pain shocking pain all the time um constant so that was our life from 2005 forward so from that day i was you know working full time and taking care of my wife um and it didn't put her in bed overnight. It was a progression over years. She's gradually losing function more and more. Um, new symptoms racking up every other week, every other month. But it came to a head in 2019. Um, at that point, she's having to sleep in a hospital bed in our room at a 45 degree angle so she wouldn't choke to death in her sleep. Um, we tried BiPAP machines, oxygen therapy, you name it. She'd been on all kinds of medication for pain control and nothing was really working. Um, and, uh, it was, it was, hey, what, you know, when you, we, it was like I married one Rupa and for three years I had this Rupa. And then after the three years was up, I was married to a different Rupa. So how did you keep it all together? Oh, how, how were there times that, how did you keep yourself encouraged? How did you keep yourself together emotionally? Um, I think it was, it was a lot of hit and miss. I mean, because you, I, I told coworkers, I remember telling coworkers at my sales job in 2005, uh, I feel like we are living now with a giant question mark in the sky hanging over our heads. What's next? What's next? And literally my day-to-day -day life. Um, we prayed. We cried out to God. Um, 
she could no longer functionally go to church. So basically, I got tired of going and leaving her here by herself, so I stopped going because I didn't feel right leaving her here at home, all alone, by herself, uh, with her fears, her worries, her concerns. And you have an active daughter. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I remember taking Asha with me to the hospital to see Mommy. Um, she was really too little to even talk that much, but she would act out, and she would be very mad because she didn't know why Mommy's away from her. Why is Mommy not at home with me? So I take her to the hospital. Hey, Asha, sit with me. It's like, eh, you know, she didn't get it. Why is Mommy not with me? So her whole life, now my daughter's 18, but her whole life was shaped by having a mommy who was was sick. Um, Rupa did as much as she could. She, uh, I think she accelerated um, her decline because she refused to let it stop her from making memories with our daughter. Um, she would go for walks with Asha when she should not have been on that, the good leg, because it wasn't the good leg anymore. It was overused, overworked. Um, but to fast forward to 19, um, I had a huge wake up call when I took her to a dentist for a routine cleaning. Um, she almost choked to death in the chair. Like they had to call me on my cell phone within 10 minutes of me leaving saying, you got to come back. We can't do anything. Uh, you we can't do anything in her mouth. She's going to have to be completely sedated um, <laughs> at a hospital dental unit. And um, to me, that was like just one scary wake up call. Like I almost lost my wife at a dentist office, like seriously. So I held my job. Uh, and then unfortunately, I had a new manager who was not sympathetic at all, didn't care. So I'm like, well, okay. I remember standing in the bedroom with my wife. And I'm like, well, you know what? Uh, if it's a choice between my job or my wife, it's, I'm choosing my wife. Yeah. God, I have to take yeah. care of her financially. But, and he did. Uh, God bless the body of Christ for the following year, the next year and a half, incredibly. Because I wasn't working. And um, so long story short, uh, she went on palliative care here at home. We had palliative care nurses coming in. Um, but her oxygen levels, because the polio caused such severe scoliosis that her lobes of her lungs were like catcher's mitts. Um, they just wouldn't inflate. So she was losing lung function like crazy. Um, I think she was down to like 55% lung capacity. Um, her oxygen levels were dropping day by day. Like, I mean, we had paramedics coming in here every day checking her vitals. And it was just horrific. But here's, here's something very powerful that I want to share because I know there's other people going through this too. Um, I know some on Facebook that are. Rupa wrote on Facebook she was going through the severe anxiety to my husband and my daughter when I leave when I'm no longer here are they going to be okay and she would lay awake at night with these anxieties not telling me anything because she didn't want me to worry well I had a dream one morning and in the dream I am looking at this tree and every branch is full of turtle doves and turtle doves typically just gather in pairs, not in a flock. And in the dream, I knew that that meant God was going to give us an abundance of peace. But I didn't know what she was going through. She wasn't telling me. So when I woke up, I told her about my dream. And then she told me, oh, honey, I've been fighting overwhelming anxiety. I just didn't want to tell you that dream is God's way of giving me peace. So the Holy Spirit is able to minister to us um, on such a deep level, um, especially in those times. And so many, so many instances where the Holy Spirit encouraged Rupa and I 
in different ways prophetically. Um, I would be walking in the living room. Uh, she had she had fallen one morning trying to get out of bed. She didn't want to wake me up because I was exhausted from being up all night caregiving. She didn't want to wake me up. She tried to get up out of bed by fell on her baby polio leg and broke the right femur at the hip joint. Hmm. And she was just shrieking in pain. So now we're dealing with more pain. Um, and I remember walking around the living room, just praying in tongues and praying in tongues, just feeling so overwhelmed by everything I was going through. And all of a sudden, I stopped praying in tongues and I started praying in English. And what came out of my mouth in English was, Lord, you are enthroned over all that concerns us. I knew that that utterance did not come from me. That was the Holy Spirit. What I just prayed in tongues. And when I said those words, Lord, you are enthroned over all that concerns us. All of a sudden, all of the heaviness and the anxiety, I felt it lift off of me. I felt it took a boulder off of my back. So the power of the Holy Spirit came and ministered powerfully and lifted all of this emotional weight off me because as a caregiver, you are entering into your loved one's sufferings in a very real way. You're identifying with their pain and their suffering as your own. And it's, it's, it's so interesting. Um, Paul says uh, of Jesus, I want to know him and the fellowship of his suffering. Yeah. Um, well, your, your story is incredibly powerful and I, I wish we had hours to tell it, but the, 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 uh, the time is getting away from us. You know, Mark, I want to encourage you and so many others out there. Listen, I, I have no idea what you walked through. I have no idea what folks walk through that care gift, but I will tell you this, the Lord does. And when you need comfort, it'll be there. When you need strength, it'll be there. When you need encouragement, it'll be there. Keep yourself encouraged. Mark Judy, a powerful story you've shared with us. You can connect with Mark on Facebook. Um, again, Vigilance for the End Times is podcast. But Mark, it, it has been a deep, deep honor. And thank you for sharing your story about your wife and, and, and your struggles and things like that. I pray this will encourage somebody, but Mark, thank you for joining me on the intentional encourager podcast. Thank you, Brian, so much. I really appreciate your heart, brother. God bless you. My thanks as always to producer Bryce Sexton and technical advisor Matt Means. And of course, the ultimate thanks goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, who provides intentional encouragement every day through his word. If you're not subscribed to the Intentional Encourager podcast, hit the subscribe button wherever you get podcasts so you don't miss an exciting episode where you can get encouraged and stay encouraged. And remember, anyone, anywhere, at any time, any place can be an intentional encourager.